Good morning, bonjour. J'aimerais commencer en soulignant que nous sommes ici réunis sur le territoire ancestral de la nation algonquine Anishinaabeg. Il me fait grand plaisir de souhaiter la bienvenue au Musée de l'aviation et de l'espace du Canada à M. Peter Schiefke, secrétaire parlementaire du Premier ministre en matière de jeunesse et député de vaudreuil soulanges au Dr. Robert Thursk, ancien astronaute canadien, et à M. Sylvain Laporte, président de l'Agence spatiale canadienne. Bienvenue à l'École Saint-Rémy. Et bonjour aux personnes qui se joignent à nous en ligne. Je m'appelle Christina Tessier. Je suis la présidente directrice générale d'Ingenium, Musée des sciences et de l'innovation du Canada. Ingenium administre ce musée ainsi que le Musée de l'agriculture et de l'alimentation du Canada et le Musée des sciences et de la technologie du Canada. Nos trois musées racontent les nombreuses histoires de gens innovateurs qui ont osé penser différemment. Ce musée-ci fait le récit des braves Canadiennes et Canadiens qui ont fait briller notre pays dans le domaine de l'aviation et de l'exploration spatiale. Comme vous pouvez l'imaginer, nous sommes très heureux d'avoir un Canadien dans l'espace, David Saint-Jacques, qui se joindra à nous dans quelques minutes. We have a proud history of working in partnership with the Canadian Space Agency to engage Canadians in our stories of space exploration, science and technology. Here at the museum, you can visit exhibitions that highlight what it's like to live on the International Space Station, like David Saint-Jacques is right now, as well as explore our country's most notable space achievements, including the Canada Arm, Canada's most famous robotic and technological achievement. We're together today to unveil an exhibition that highlights a lesser known aspect of space exploration. Cette nouvelle exposition porte sur certains des dangers pour la santé des astronautes qui séjournent dans l'espace. Elle explique aussi comment la science qui se fait sur la Station spatiale internationale nous permet de mieux comprendre le corps humain et de trouver des solutions aux troubles qui affectent, entre autres, le cœur, les vaisseaux sanguins ou la densité des eaux. L'exposition comprend aussi des artefacts de notre collection vraiment intéressants qui illustrent comment le Canada aide les astronautes à rester en, en santé dans l'espace. Par exemple, vous verrez le traîneau pour l'expérience de physiologie spatiale qui a accompagné l'astronaute canadienne Roberta Bondar à bord de la navette spatiale Discovery. I also want to take a moment to thank the amazing teams at the Canadian Space Agency and here from this museum who worked on this new exhibition. Like the four small stars in David Saint-Jacques' mission patch, they are the people behind the scenes that make things happen. Alors, plus, sans plus tarder, veuillez accueillir M. Peter Schiefke pour précéder à l'ouverture officielle de cette nouvelle exposition. Donc, bon matin tout le monde. C'est un plaisir et un honneur pour moi d'être ici en tant que député fédéral de vaudreuil soulanges mais aussi au nom du premier ministre. Euh, j'ai parlé avec le premier ministre, puis j'ai expliqué qu ce qui, qu qui s'est passé ce matin, puis il dit « Garde, il faut que tu poses cette question aux jeunes de l'école catholique Saint-Rémy. » Puis la question est la suivante. « Qui entre vous veut devenir des astronautes? » Levez vos mains. « Put your hands up if you want to be an astronaut when you're older. » OK. So that's an important question. And it's an important question because how many of you want to go to Mars or the moon? Put your hands up. Okay, well, what's interesting is that there were less hands that went up for becoming astronauts, but every one of you wants to go to the moon or to go to Mars. Now, that's a really important question. Why? Because the Prime Minister wants to challenge every one of you to be that next astronaut that's going to go to Mars and go to the moon. The stats show that we're probably going to go to Mars or back to the moon within 20 or 30 years. And the people who are going to be those astronauts are sitting in this room right now. They're your age, which is really exciting. So what do you got to do to become an astronaut? Well, there's two things, one of which I'll talk about and one of which I'm going to leave to my esteemed uh, colleague, somebody who I admire greatly, uh, Dr. Robert Thirsk, who's uh, an astronaut that's going to talk to you a little bit about it. First is, you got to get your education. How many of you are getting good grades in school? Put your hands up. Okay. Well, if you want to be an astronaut, you have to go to school after high school for about 10 to 15 years. How many of you think that's fun? <laughs> all right. Well, you got to do that, and I encourage you all to stay in school, to get that education. That's what's going to help you become an astronaut. The second thing is you need to become healthy. You need to make sure that you're in tip-top shape because astronauts are in tip-top shape, which is why it's really exciting to be here to launch this new exhibition on health in space. 
And what the astronauts, like David St. Jacques, that you're going to talk to, which is the coolest thing ever, uh, are going to talk to you about. And to do that, to explain it all to you, and to lead us through all of this today, it's an honor and a privilege for me to introduce to you somebody who I admire, I'm not going to lie, uh, an astronaut who holds the record for spending the most amount of time in space as a Canadian astronaut who flew both with a Soyuz Russian spacecraft as well as the space shuttle on a space mission STS-78. I think I got that right. Please give a huge round of applause for Dr. Robert Thursk. Wow. Thank you, Mr. Shipke. Uh, je suis très content uh, d'être avec vous tous aujourd'hui. Nous sommes ici pour parler de deux sujets, deux sujets qui me tiennent beaucoup à le cœur. Premièrement, l'espace. Uh, comme vous le savez déjà, je suis astronaute. Et deuxièmement, uh, la santé. Et je suis aussi médecin. I'm looking forward like all of you, in a few minutes, to speak with our friend David Saint-Jacques. David launched to space uh, on December the 3rd, and he has now spent two months in space experiencing the wonder of living and working aboard the International Space Station. What a privilege, what an experience, and it's definitely the highlight of his career. Vivre dans l'espace, c'est incroyable, mais ce n'est pas toujours une partie de plaisir pour notre corps. C'est même dangereux à cause de la pesanteur, du rayonnement et de l'isolement. The nature of weightlessness, ionizing radiation, and psychological isolation need to be better understood uh, in order to make spaceflight safer for astronauts of the future when we venture off to the moon, to the Mars, and beyond. So I had the opportunity, as Peter mentioned, to fly twice in space, once aboard the space shuttle, and then secondly, aboard the International Space Station. The first mission lasted 17 days, and the second flight lasted six months. But you know what? That wasn't long enough. I miss the work that I did. I miss viewing our beautiful planet from the vantage point of orbital flight. And most of all, I miss my crewmates. We were an incredible team and we worked very well together. But six months of space flight took a toll on my body. Uh, in spite of daily exercise, I lost aerobic fitness. I lost muscle strength and my bones began to demineralize as well. My eyes and my vision were affected. And then after six months, I missed my family, I missed my friends, and I missed nature. The good news is that the International Space Station can help us to address some of these issues that I just mentioned. The station is an incredible medical laboratory. Scientists from around the world now for 20 years have been using this unique laboratory to study all sorts of phenomena, all sorts of sciences. I'm particularly proud of our Canadian scientists who have contributed to health research in space. And their research is helping us to better understand the risks to astronauts of space flight, and also to help reduce the impact that the space environment has on the human body. And as a bonus, a lot of the research a lot of the findings from the research of our Canadian scientists can actually help to address some of the healthcare issues here with patients on Earth as well. So David, qui se joindra très bientôt à nous, participe à un grand nombre d'expériences à bord de la station. Les astronautes sont de parfaits cobayes pour les scientifiques qui étudient les effets de l'espace sur la santé humaine. David has also followed a strict routine over the last two months to make sure he can stay healthy while he's in space. He's been following a diet and an exercise program to help, for instance, the, this problem of bone loss and uh, muscle degradation that we spoke about. 
pour avoir une idée de ce que David fait à bord de la station, j'aimerais qu'on fasse une petite démonstration. I'd now like to introduce Natalie Hirsch, the nutrition and exercise specialist for the Canadian Space Agency. Natalie was my nutrition and exercise coach before, during, and after my last mission, and now she's playing that same role for David. And she'll now lead us in some of the exercises that David does to stay fit in space. Natalie. Well, thank you very much, Bob. <laughs> Uh, I'm very happy to be here today. I'd like to ask all of you to stand up and we can all do uh, an exercise demonstration together. And even those that are joining us uh, uh, through Facebook can do this as well. We're going to be standing in place. Just make sure you've got enough room around you so that you don't hit yourself or your colleagues. That would be bad. Um, so we're going to start from the top. This is going to be a warm-up that you can do on the ground or in space. Um, and David will join us a little bit later and give us a little demonstration of some of the uniqueness of space. So first of all, stand up straight and imagine that somebody's pulling you up to the ceiling so you've got a good posture. Then you're going to rotate your hands forward um, so that your palms are facing forward. And we'll start with some neck stretches. So just dropping your ear to your shoulder, one side and then the other side. Then we're going to rotate one side and then the other side. Let's move down to our shoulders with some shoulder circles. So just rolling your shoulders backwards. And then we're going to do a forwards as well. Next, we're going to make this movement even bigger and start doing some arm circles. So let's go up and around. Just watch your neighbors. <laughs> Don't want any black eyes. <laughs> And there's Mary Andre that's also helping out, so she'll give some alternative exercises if there's not enough room around you. You can watch her. So we've been warming up our shoulders. Now we're going to warm up our shoulders a bit more and our brains by doing arm circles going in the opposite directions. So start with your arms up, and then you're going to bring one arm forward and the other arm back. So opposite directions and up. Great. Wow, you guys are good. Let's do it two more t uh, one more time. And then we're going to try the other way. So start with the other hand in front, one arm forward, the other arm back, making a big circle. Can you feel your brains working as well as your shoulders? All right. OK, very good. Next, we're going to do some hip, hip exercises. So this is just like doing the hula hoop. We'll do some hip, hip circles. So just go around, circling your hips three times. And other direction, very good. Now we're going to do some squats. So a squat is just like sitting on a chair. So just pretend you're going to sit backwards on your chair. Very good. We'll do this a few more times. Each time, go a little bit lower. Bob is an expert in squats. He did squats every day for six months when he was on space station to keep his muscles strong. And we'll do one more. Next, we're going to do some balance. So balance is not a problem in microgravity, but it's a problem when you get back to to Earth. So we're going to stand on one leg. Once you've got your balance and you can pretend that somebody's pulling you up again, then start swinging your legs back and forward. And this makes it even harder to keep your balance. And then at the end, go into a Superman pose. So this is really easy to do in space. Let's do the other leg. Standing on your one leg, getting your balance. Once you have that, you can whoop. You can start swinging your leg, and then you're going to go into Superman. Into Superman. <laughs> Very good. All right. We have uh, time for just one more exercise as Bob starts getting ready to join David. So what we're going to do is a full body exercise. Start with your arms up. Now we're going to bend down, touch your toes. <laughs> And then drop your hips down. So now you're back to that squatting position again. Your hands are going to be together like this. Arms up and stand up. We'll do that one more time, and then we'll take a break. So touching your toes, hips down, hands together, arms up, and stand up. Wow, you guys are amazing. Very good.
You can have a seat now. So the live connection with um, David and the space station is going to begin in the next uh, couple of minutes. We're looking at, uh, right now, Mission Control in Houston. And uh, we're looking at the, the flight director and the CAPCOM who speak uh, directly with the, the crew, guide them through their, their um, plan, their work plan every day. Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston, this is Station. I'm ready. Canadian Houston, this is Station. Control. I'm ready. Please call Station for a voice check. Canadian Space Agency, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. Station, this is Ottawa in the Canada Aviation and Space Museum. How do you hear us? Bob, I have you loud and clear. How do you do, my friend? Bob, I have you loud and clear. How do you do, my friend? Uh, bonjour, David. Uh, it's good to be speaking with you. Um, plusieurs élèves d'Ottawa et moi, nous étions en train d'effectuer une séance d'exercice avec uh, notre copain, Natalie Hirsch. Natalie. Hi, David. It's really great to see you. Um, we've been doing an exercise session, and we have two more exercises to do, and we're hoping you can join us. Very good, sure. So you guys have been... Uh, have been seeing Very good, sure. So you guys have been, uh, Coach have been seeing how strict Coach Natalie is. She's my coach up here, and uh, she keeps me in good shape. So we're going to do uh, two more exercises. The first one is one where we're going to stretch the front of our legs. So you're going to take one leg. Yep, everybody can stand up and try this. That's great. So one foot behind so that your heel is touching your butt, and you should feel a good stretch in the front of your leg. And we're going to wait for David to give us a demo as well. Good job, David. <laughs> Okay, and we can switch legs, and... <laughs> As you can see, it's much easier in space. <laughs> okay, we'll do one more exercise, and this one is a figure four. So for all of us on the ground, we're gonna cross one ankle over our other knee to make a figure four with our legs, and then we're gonna sit backwards like we're sitting in a chair again. This is another good balance exercise. All right. It looks so much easier in space, doesn't it? Wow. Okay, and let's do it with the other leg. All right. Great job, everyone. Thanks, David, for the demo. <laughs> Thanks, Natalie. Uh, merci, David, for the uh, out-of-this-world exercise demo. <laughs> David, I, I don't want to interrupt your Zen moment, but we have a couple of questions for you. <laughs> All right, some of the exercises that you have been doing in space to counter the effects of weightlessness. So basically our exercise regime here uh, is comprised of four things. So actually. basically our exercise regime here uh, is comprised of four things, I guess. Stretching, of course, which is very important. You got a good demonstration of this uh, today. It's a bit different than on Earth, but uh, we do it, it's very important. And then we're gonna keep our cardiovascular system strong. We have a stationary bicycle. That's very similar to being on Earth, except you don't have a seat. You don't need to sit down, of course. And uh, another one is a treadmill, so you can be practice running. That's important for two things. First, because we wear a, uh, a harness with uh, strong uh, springs to kind of bring us down, it adds weight to our spine, our, our uh, skeletal system, our bones, and keeps them strong. And also, it keeps you practicing the movement you need to be walking and running so that when you come back to Earth, you remember how to walk. And third, 
we have a general purpose uh, kind of uh, weightlifting machine. Of course, it's not weights because that would be very easy, right, with dumbbells in space. Instead, we're fighting against the pressure in a in a piston, and that's what we use to keep training our upper body, shoulders, arms, uh, the legs, the calves, every muscle in our body we can work out with this amazing machine called the AIRED. And thanks to that, we come back to Earth, and I don't know what your experience was, Bob, but uh, I'm hoping to come back to Earth uh, feeling that I'm not, uh, not weakened by this stay in space. Uh, good question. Do you find that um, your body, after two months in space now, has adapted? Has your mind, your muscles, your heart, have, has it adapted to life in zero G? Completely, quite a change. When I got here, uh, it was actually very funny. Completely, quite a change. When I got here, uh, it was actually very funny because uh, as soon as I was upside down, I was lost. I didn't know <laughs> where to go. And I was a very bad flyer initially, like most astronauts for the first time, crashing into the walls everywhere as I move around. Um, now I can navigate very quickly and know where I am and never break anything. And also, I find that uh, I started out uh, very congested. All, you know, when you're standing on the Earth, the pull of gravity brings your most of your blood down, and your body is trained to push harder to bring blood to your head. When you reach space, you don't have that bias anymore. If you want the effect of gravity, and so, but the body keeps pushing harder towards the head, so you get a big, red, puffy head and tiny, white, skinny, skinny legs. And but after a while, that fades away, and uh, you become normal again. So even the congestion is gone. So yeah, after two months. Uh, I feel like uh, this is normal now, this, like there's nothing to it. Um, you know, we've talked about weightlessness, the effect of weightlessness on the muscles and the bones, but it's not the only factor that affects your health in orbit. Ionizing radiation is another concern. Uh, I know that on Earth, the atmosphere protects us against radiation, but have you experienced um, uh, radiation in space? Have you um, done any monitoring of r radiation levels? So yes, we are not protected here by uh, the uh, by our atmosphere. So yes, we are not protected here by uh, the uh, by our atmosphere, as you said. We're a little bit protected by the magnetic field of the Earth still, but it's it's quite a bit less. Every astronaut monitor. We wear a little uh, radiation monitor uh, on us the whole time. It just looks like a I don't know. Looks like a little square of plastic, like this. That we wear on us that measures radiation. But the effect of radiation it's very interesting. I'm sure you've seen that too. At night, when your eyes are closed, sometimes you can see cosmic radiation hitting the back of your eye, the retina, and it makes a flash. And in the middle of the night, you see flashes. Maybe every couple minutes, you'll see a flash like that. That's radiation hitting your eyes. Another thing that we think of is uh, when there's a, sometimes the radiation goes up and down, with the, depending on the activity on the sun. And so that may be a, a reason to you know, be more careful and maybe spend more time in areas of the station that are better protected. One of these is our little bedrooms that has got slightly thicker walls to protect us from uh, radiation. I understand that uh, Canadian scientists uh, are interested in radiation dissimetry, radiation monitoring, and that a couple of weeks ago you deployed some r Canadian uh, monitors throughout the station. Could you tell us a little bit about that experiment? Yes, uh, it's a very neat experiment using an old-fashioned technology, but it's very, very Yes, uh, it's a very neat experiment using an old-fashioned technology, but it's very, very reliable, and they modernized it. It's called a bubble detector. So the little ampullas of a substance that, when it gets hit by a radiation, it creates a little gas bubble, and it stays trapped into that jelly-like substance. And then with a microscope, you can count the bubbles, and that tells you how many radiation hits there were. Uh, so these so-called bubble decimeters, we, um, we spread them around station and uh, recently my Russian uh, colleague Oleg has uh, used uh, the special equipment to count all these bubbles and I'm looking forward to hearing uh, the results. Here at the Canada Aviation and Space Museum we're looking at the impact of weightlessness and, and uh, radiation on human health in space but we're also looking at uh, psychological isolation as well. Uh, are there any health concerns of living in space in such a remote location on your mind, on your well-being? Yes, you're right. Uh, we should never forget about that, and that may be at the end of the day the most important. Yes, you're right. Uh, you should never forget about that, and that may be at the end of the day the most important aspect uh, of maintaining humans uh, in uh, exploration environments. Not just through here, but also people who are on submarines or long-distance, uh, you know, deployments. So the problem you 
you develop here is that everything is a little bit the same every day. It can be depressing sometimes if you're not careful. You're very, very far away from the people you love on Earth, and that can make you sad, perhaps. You're always with the same people on board, so if conflict arises, it can be you have nowhere to go. Uh, you have to face it. So it is, a, it is a challenge. We prepare a lot for this as astronauts, and uh, I'm sure, Bob, you, you have stories to tell about that as well. But we go on expeditions on Earth uh, with fellow astronauts for long durations before to get used to this uh, this notion that you know the most important people right now are the few people who are here with me and I must get along with them and uh, that is the uh, the key to our success because we can't function well of course if we're not happy and you cannot be happy if you're not getting along with people around you uh, merci david pour cette belle discussion uh, merci de nous avoir partagé ton expérience uh, David, there's a room full of curious students and also media here at the museum. Uh, would you like to hear from them? We have many questions for you. Go ahead. I look, always like to answer questions. Go ahead. I look, always like to answer questions. Bonjour, David. Quelle est l'application possible des résultats obtenus par vos recherches sur le vieillissement de la population? des problématiques associées comme la densité des eaux, le durcissement des artères. Oui, alors, la raison pour laquelle c'est tellement intéressant de faire de la recherche... Oui, alors, la raison pour laquelle c'est tellement intéressant de faire de la recherche médicale en orbite, c'est parce que être dans l'espace, dans le fond, c'est pas bon pour la santé. Ça plein de... On a évolué sur Terre pendant des millions d'années avec l'effet de la gravité. Quand on enlève ça, presque tous les systèmes du corps humain sont débalancés. Les os s'affaiblissent, la... les muscles s'affaiblissent, le... on sent... perd le sens d'orientation, la mémoire est affectée aussi, il y a des systèmes immunitaires, des effets sur le système immunitaire. Et globalement, ça ressemble à une espèce de vieillissement accéléré qu'on subit, réversible en partie quand on revient. Mais ce qui est intéressant, c'est que tous les effets qu'on ressent, les astronautes à bord, tous les problèmes de santé qu'on développe, C'est presque équivalent à des maladies qu'on aura soit sur Terre très, très semblables. Donc, en étudiant les problèmes qui se développent les astronautes, qui se développent très rapidement chez les gens plus jeunes et en santé, on peut, de manière très isolée, très spécifique, étudier la maladie qui lui ressemble. Et ça fait de nous un peu des cobayes idéaux pour la recherche médicale. Merci beaucoup. Bon. Bonjour, David. Mon nom est Gavin et j'aimerais te demander une question. Um, quand tu es malade en espace, comment ton corps réagit-il? Oui, Gavin, alors, il y a, il y a des différences dans l'espace quand on est malade. Oui, Gavin, alors, il y a, il y a des différences dans l'espace quand on est malade. Si on, si on se euh, se bat, si par exemple, se évidemment, si on... Euh, Si on, si on se frappe, euh, si on saigne, le sang ne va pas vouloir tomber. Euh, il va rester là. Alors, donc les plus, euh, Alors, comment on fait pour traiter les maladies ici? On a une petite pharmacie. Euh, tout le monde est entraîné à bord. Moi, je suis médecin, mais ce n'est pas tous les astronautes qui sont médecins. Mais ceux qui ne le sont pas sont tous entraînés euh, à être capables de répondre aux urgences médicales. Donc, on est tous euh, entre bonnes mains. Euh, on a ce qu'il faut pour répondre à des médicales, donc on est tous euh, entre bonnes mains. Euh, on a ce qu'il faut pour répondre à des gros des problèmes cardiaques, des, des fractures, des pour faire des, an des, an des antibiotiques. Donc, on, a, on est pas mal bien équipé. Mais le plus important, évidemment, c'est d'être prudent. On est prudent pour ne pas tomber malade. On est prudent pour les infections. On est en quarantaine avant de venir en, en orbite. On est très prudent ici à bord pour ne pas se faire mal. C'est ça, si on veut, là, évidemment... Le, le, la, la chose la plus importante pour rester en bonne santé, c'est d'être prudent et de respecter son corps, respecter ses limites. Et c'est d'être prudent et de respecter son corps, respecter ses limites. Bonjour David, mon nom est Audrey et j'aimerais moi aussi vous demander une question. Avez-vous parfois des conflits entre astronautes dans l'espace? Très bonne question, Audrey. Très importante. Oui, évidemment. Euh, dès qu'il y a des êtres humains il y a, et qu'il y a des relations, euh, il, y a des, il y a des conflits, c'est sûr. On est un peu, nous, les astronautes euh, en mission comme ça, on est un peu comme des frères et des sœurs qui vivons ensemble. Alors, même si on s'aime beaucoup, puis on se respecte beaucoup, puis on aime ça être ensemble, puis travailler ensemble, des fois, il y a des conflits, des fois, il y a des chicanes. Alors, on en parle. L'important, c'est de s'en parler, de trouver un terrain d'entente et de régler ça et de redevenir dans le, le droit chemin. 
Donc, les, euh, les conflits, ça fait partie de la vie. C'est normal, il ne faut pas les éviter. Il faut les accepter, y faire face, trouver une solution. Donc, c'est une partie très importante de notre vie à bord, de toujours s'assurer qu'il n'y a pas de conflits cachés ou secrets et qu'on se parle de tout très clairement. Secrets et qu'on se parle de tout très clairement. Bonjour David, mon nom est Chloé et voici la question que je vais te poser. Qu'est-ce qui est le plus éprouvant ou difficile pour toi dans l'espace? Et est-ce que tu te sens seul? Oui, Chloé. Alors, tu sais, pour moi, le plus difficile, c'est que moi, j'ai une famille, je suis, euh, je suis papa, j'ai trois enfants et je m'ennuie beaucoup d'eux. Donc, c'est ça qui est le plus difficile. J'aimerais ça pouvoir inviter les gens que j'aime pour venir me voir. J'aimerais ça que ma famille puisse venir ici, que mes amis puissent venir ici. Ça, on ne peut pas. Donc, ça, c'est la partie la plus difficile, c'est de se sentir très, très loin euh, des gens qu'on aime, très loin de notre vie sur Terre. Mais on peut leur parler. Donc, je leur parle beaucoup, on fait des vidéos beaucoup, et puis on peut, je peux, euh, comme ça, on garde un contact, même si on n'est pas en contact direct, on peut garder un contact émotif quand même, et c'est ça qui est le plus important. Bonjour David, mon nom est Lauren, et c'est quoi les rayonnements cosmiques, et qu'est-ce que ça fait encore Alors, les rayonnements cosmiques, c'est des petites particules euh, élémentaires comme des électrons ou des protons qui viennent de très, très loin, qui viennent du fond, fond, fond de l'univers. Il y en a d'autres qui viennent du soleil directement et qui, normalement, sont, on est protégé sur Terre. L'atmosphère, la, la, la ceinture de champ magnétique de la Terre, puis après ça, l'atmosphère arrête la plupart de ces radi radiations-là et ça, on est protégé. Ici, dans l'espace, on est moins protégé. On a juste les murs de notre station spatiale pour nous protéger. Ils ne sont pas très épais. Et quand ces radiations-là frappent notre corps, ils peuvent faire des changements à notre ADN, à notre code génétique. Et souvent, des changements au code génétique, ce n'est pas grave, le corps peut le réparer, ou c'est une partie du code génétique qui n'est pas très importante, ça ne change rien. Mais des fois, si tu n'es pas chanceux, c'est comme ça que ça peut commencer un cancer. Donc, c'est ça le, le plus gros risque, peut-être, lié aux radiations, c'est que ça peut faire des changements génétiques qui peuvent un jour mener à un cancer. Donc, c'est euh, pour ça qu'on fait très attention aux radiations ici. C'est pour ça qu'on fait très attention aux radiations ici. Bonjour, David. Mon nom est Samuel. Et ma question est, comment te déplaces-tu ou t'orientes-tu à bord de la station spatiale? Alors, pour se déplacer, c'est très différent de sur Terre. On est un peu comme des singes dans les arbres. On se déplace seulement avec les mains, comme ça, en, en agrippant des poignées. Et avec nos pieds, des fois, on transporte des objets. Fait que si j'ai quelque chose à amener, je vais le prendre avec mes pieds. Puis je me déplace comme ça avec mes mains. Puis pour m'orienter, ben ce n'est pas très grand, la station. Alors, maintenant, je la connais par cœur. Euh, donc, je me déplace euh, comme ça. L'important, c'est d'être capable de reconnaître où est-ce qu'on est, même si on est sur le côté, même si on est à l'envers. C'est ça qui est le plus difficile au début. On devient très désorienté dès qu'on change de direction. Mais après quelques mois, c'est facile pour moi. Facile pour moi. Bonjour, David. Je m'appelle Alissa. Et voici mon question. Au retour sur Terre, qu'est-ce qui sera le plus difficile pour toi? Par exemple, aurais-tu de la difficulté à marcher ou courir? Est-ce que ce sera plus difficile de manger ou de bien digérer? Alors, pour, quand on revient sur Terre, oui, il y a des effets physiques qui sont assez difficiles, on m'a prévenu. D'abord, euh, la gravité fait que notre sang a tendance à tomber dans nos jambes quand on revient sur Terre. Ça fait qu'on peut s'évanouir très facilement parce qu'on manque un peu de sang à la tête. C'est comme quand on se lève trop vite. Donc ça, c'est au début, ça prend, peut prendre quelques jours, quelques semaines avant d'avoir toujours assez de pression dans la tête pour ne pas s'évanouir. Après ça, bien, il y a le sens de l'équilibre. Ici, dans l'espace, j'ai perdu le sens de l'équilibre parce que ça ne sert à rien. Alors mon corps a comme oublié, mon cerveau a oublié comment ça marche, l'équilibre. Et quand je vais revenir sur Terre, il va falloir que je tienne la main d'un ami pour marcher pendant quelques jours parce que je vais facilement tomber ou peut-être même avoir mal au cœur si je bouge la tête trop vite. Euh, ça, c'est deux grosses, deux grosses différences, euh, l'équilibre euh, et puis le, le, les problèmes de pression euh, dans la tête. 
Ensuite, bien, si je, maintenant, je fais beaucoup d'exercices grâce à, à mon entraîneur, euh, Nathalie. Donc, je réussis quand même à rester fort. Mais c'est très important parce que si on ne fait rien dans l'espace, si on ne fait aucun sport, on va devenir très faible parce qu'ici, tout est très léger. Il y a même un objet très lourd, il ne pèse rien ici. Alors, notre corps, euh, nos muscles et nos os vont s'affaiblir si on ne fait rien. Donc, ça, c'est important si on veut de rester fort, de faire l'exercice. Hi, David. Elizabeth Howell from Space.com. Uh, probably just like uh, me, you grew up watching Star Trek. What uh, medical technology on the space station is even cooler than what was portrayed in the future on Star Trek? Thanks. Hey, Elizabeth. Nice to speak to you. Well, actually, as far as medical equipment goes uh, on the station, we're pretty uh, conservative, I would say. We, you know, there's very high-tech medical technology on the ground, and that is what uh, we use here. There's a, sometimes, because we don't have all the equipment we need, we scratch our heads and we invent new methods on station that then are used uh, on the ground. For example, uh, a couple of years ago, people started to think, hmm, we don't have an X-ray machine here on space. How could we figure out if someone has a a hole in their lungs if they have a big blow to the chest without an x-ray machine. And so we figured out a way in space using an ultrasound machine, because that's all we had. But now, that's what we do on Earth to look for uh, punctured lungs. We use an ultrasound machine. So that's one example of an idea developed in space that we can use on the ground. Another cool technology is uh, a shirt that we wear that measures our heartbeat, our body temperature, uh, our blood pressure, And that, that shirt is a prototype that I've made by a Canadian company that I've tried recently. And so we hope that uh, that will become a, a very common product. It will be, be very useful for uh, people who are deployed, who are military, for example, or people who are elderly people who are stuck at home, for whom it's difficult to go to the hospital. They could have their health checked remotely, things like that. Their health checked remotely, things like that. Hello, David. Uh, I'm Ananya Vagila from the Ottawa Citizen. I was just wondering, what's the hardest thing to describe about being in space? Ah, good question. You know, I think it's that view out of the window. The, the, the unbelievable beauty of planet Earth. It is so touching. Every time I open those, cupo those shutters on the cupola, uh, and our viewing uh, observation platform, and I see this, this beautiful planet. It's just quietly spinning in the black velvet of space with this kind of bright blue halo surrounding it. That's the air that protects us from space and that harbors all the life. And the pattern of clouds and thunder, it's just alive. You can see it, it's almost breathing. It's so beautiful. It's, uh, it, it just changes my perspective on life to, to have seen that is my perspective on life to, to have seen that. Uh, thank you, David. That's all the time, unfortunately, that we have with you uh, today. Thank you, everyone, uh, for your very thoughtful questions uh, for David. Uh, David, uh, thank you for connecting with us. Um, you're a great ambassador for Canada. Uh, stay safe and stay healthy. Goodbye. Merci.